there might be some money, there might be some some notoriety, but like if you want to do something that hasn't been done, you get a, you better get ready for a bunch of barriers. And so the fact that Jack got excited about that as opposed to scared meant that I picked a good partner. I have to say, like your book is super awesome, and I wish I read this. I guess like ten years earlier, so I could have some sort of company going on right now. So it's such a great read, and yeah, in general. Thanks. I wish I'd known a lot of that stuff earlier myself. I've had several conversations with people who said, "Boy, where was this book twenty years ago when I needed it?" Um, but look, I didn't realize a lot of the stuff until Square got attacked by Amazon, and then I. I mean, it took me two years of solid research to figure out what the hell happened to to me, you know, in my own company. So I'm not surprised that it's sort of a revelation to some people who haven't lived through it. I love that. I feel like if I already successfully started Square, I would not try to figure out why Square succeed. <laughs> But I think that's such well, a great thing to do. So it, I think it was survivor's guilt. I mean, I think what what I felt. After Amazon, so for for those of you who don't know, Amazon copied Square's products when we were a startup. When Amazon does this to a startup, the startup dies. That happens 100% of the time,、uh, at least up until Square. And then we were the only company to ever、uh, really survive that、uh, that onslaught. And a year later, Amazon gave up. And 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 I was super happy about that, but I was also it felt really weird because it's like, well, why did that happen? Like I couldn't explain what happened. I had this this feeling of survivor's guilt, so that's what led me to the book and to do all the research. And then what I did was I eventually found you know dozens of other companies that had had the same thing happen to them. And I was like, oh wait a second, there's a pattern here.、Um, and 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 honestly, I wasn't even sure I was going to write a book, but、uh, Herb Kelleher, who's the founder of Southwest Airlines and 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 a legend,、um, and I know you wouldn't think there's much. In common between you know an airline and a you know tech company, but、um, I thought that the Southwest story fit the Square pattern. I thought it had an innovation stack,、mm -hmm. and so I went down to talk to Herb, and he,、uh, you know, it's it's really weird because I basically took all this research and I said, here's what I think. What do you think? And then I just shut up and let the man talk for like two and a half hours. And at the end of the two and a half hours, he got really excited about what I. Sort of been talking about,、mm -hmm. and he says, "How are you going to share this with the world? Like, what's your next step? Like, how are you going to take this and not just make it some personal thing?" And I was like, "Oh crap! I got to write a book." <laughs> so that's how the book create a podcast. So, <laughs> yeah, I could have done a podcast,、um, but you know,、um, for me, the act of writing is really、uh, is really good because I can redo it and redo it and redo it until the words are really right.、Mm -hmm. um, And then I can I can I can shorten it. So this book, every time I write it or rewrote it, it got shorter. I love the length of the book, and then like I feel like it's so easy to read. So I normally just listening to audible book, and then I read this book. I feel like I mean I'm trying to find your dirty joke in here, but、oh. maybe because I'm Chinese, so it's hard for me. <laughs> yeah,、um, if you're not a ten year old American boy, it's it's a little hard to.、Uh, it might be a little. So, so the, you know the story of the dirty joke. Yeah. Okay.、Um, I wrote it, and I was on an airplane, and I started laughing out loud because I've got a really childish sense of humor. And then, and then I erased it, and I thought, oh wait a second, no, I'm being a jerk because I knew my editor would have fun crossing it out. Like I knew he'd enjoy going. You can't say that.、Um, so I left it in. Uh, unbeknownst to me, my editor had already taken another job, so he had basically checked out for the last the last like third of the book. I don't even know if he read it. I mean, I'm sure he read it, but you know, he probably read it, you know, with a beer in his hand or something. But like he he was basically really tough on me for the first third of the book, and then the second he was kind of, and the third he was just gone. So I feel you. So I told him, I said, I said, man, you missed the dirtiest joke I've ever written. And he's like, "Well, you got to tell me where it is." And I was like, "No, actually, I don't. <laughs> you got to find it." <laughs> so, so he never found it, so I made it into print. 
<laughs> and I'm not telling anyone where it is because it would embarrass me. But it's in there. Oh gosh. Um, it's definitely yeah. in there. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna watch maybe like 20 episodes of South Park and then find it again just, yeah, yeah. just in case. South Park will help. That is that is a good way to get sort of dialed in. Perfect. I hear you. So I like that, like I like but dislike about like how humble you are in this book uh, about telling about your own story, because I think a huge amount of chapters are about other people, right? Like the guy who created IKEA, the guy who created um, Southwest Airline, and then uh, the, the guy who created Bank of America, you spend only some chapter, quote unquote, like talking about uh, bragging or like talking about your own story. And I think and you did it in a really humble way. I like that. But to start off the show, I would love to just like talk about you for a minute, right? So you have this really legendary story of you wrote a textbook in college in a subject that you were not really an expert in. And then you were a glass blower. And then you started Square with your intern at your own company a couple of years ago, right? So, yeah. and then this intern turned out to be one of the most successful tech people, tech founder, you know, Jack Dorsey. So there's there's no doubt that he is like definitely one of the most like famous person in tech. And then you eventually end up su successfully starting Square with him. And then you interview your hero, Herb Kelleher. That's a life story right there. So I feel like this is such a great story. And I wish I could learn more about among these stories, what is your favorite one? And like, what event that kind of impact you the most as a, as a person? Well, I, I think the events that impact me the most are ones that don't make good stories. You know, they're um, like one of my friends is having a real problem uh, right now in his family. And I'm spending a lot of time with him. Um, and that's hugely impactful. It's not a good story. Uh, 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 you, you know, I, I, hap I happen to be lucky because I have said yes to so many crazy things that over the course of you know, my life so far, crazy things generate good stories. Okay, hanging out with sane people who are super rational and really dialed in uh, and super organized doesn't lead to great stories. Hanging out with Bob Pazdurka, who, like I saw him last week, and and he's 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 still nuts. He's the guy with the car, you know, the yeah, hood. In, in your book, yeah. Like, you know, but that's just one of probably a hundred stories. Now, Bob's got his issues, right? Um, but that's the people I I tend to gravitate towards. And so so as a result of saying yes to a bunch of stupid stuff that I probably shouldn't be doing and hang out with people who, you know, are also doing stuff they probably shouldn't be doing. You know, you, you end up with a bunch of stories, right? And, and, and the best stories are ones where there's a calamity, right? The best stories are the ones where, you know, uh, it, it goes wrong. Um, so yeah, that, that also leads to a lot of humility. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, much wiser person than I said, I've got a lot to be humble about. And I, I believe it. I, I, I should just shut up and listen most of the time. I guess like that is really humble. And then I like that you are still friends with people that are, you know, before you become this billionaire character that like, you know, like, you know, you have that with your friends before and then after you're very successful, you're still in touch with people that really matters to you. I, I really like that. Well, but Grace, I mean, in in in, in a lot of ways, it's so much easier for me to trust people who liked me before all the fancy money and notoriety, you know, all the stuff that happened mm -hmm. um, really warps your sense of, or I, I, I won't say for you, but like for me, um, I'm, a, I'm less trusting these days because I meet people and they're charming. They're really nice and they're you know super cool. And then I think, well, maybe they just want money. Like maybe yeah. they just want an introduction. Maybe they would just want their kid to get the kid into square or some, some other. So I'm, I'm, I'm much more uh, suspicious, but if you, you know, if you hung out with me, you know, 15 years ago when I was pretty much the same as I am today, but I wasn't sort of billionaire or anything. Um, 
yeah, I think, I think they get grandfathered in. And I cherish those friends. Like those people to me have no other motivation uh, that is, you know, perverse. So I, it's kind of lonely in my situation, but I, you don't get to complain about it, right? <laughs> I mean, I think it is a real issue. Like, I, I feel like that's why probably a lot of people don't really know who their real friends are after they got hit a certain stage of success. So they can only, I guess, like hang out with people that are like either all on the same financial situation with them or like, I feel like it, it is kind of lonely. I, I feel you. It, it, it is. I, I had a guy that I met, this was 30 years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, and I was hanging out with a friend in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And um, this guy has had, had gotten separated from his wife that night. Right. And my friend was gay. And this guy was straight. And I'm straight. So like, I had to handle the straight guy because the gay guy was off in his thing. And I was like, so I was like two straight guys. So he told me this whole story. And it was chilling because he was super successful. He made a ton of money. And he, um, his wife didn't like him when he was poor, but she liked him when he was rich. And then once they got married, she went back to not liking him again. Uh, and, and I was like, felt so sorry for him. Um, because I think a lot of people do lose touch with, you know, um, it, it, it's easy to lose touch when you have a lot of wealth. Yeah. I'm trying not to do that. Yeah, I feel you. But also, I mean, congrats on the wealth. I mean, it's not a bad thing either. So. It's not bad. I mean, it, but it doesn't, in, in my case, what I've, what, I've, what I've discovered is it doesn't really matter because I don't have the ego for it. Like, mm -hmm. I just don't really care about the, the super glitzy, fancy stuff. I mean, I live in St. Louis, Missouri, you know, um, like one of my cars is a 95 Acura. Mm -hmm. I get the still ones. I can't sell it. I mean, I love it. I mean, I think I just, I got a two car garage, you know, um, <laughs> it's not, it's not a blingy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I got a friend with a boat. <laughs> I love that. Um, so in general, I'm curious about who do you consider as on your personal board of advisors? You mentioned a lot of really, you know, the historic characters that are great founders, curious when it comes to career decisions or life decisions, who do you normally consult with? Well, you know, um, it would, uh, unfortunately, I've lost two of them in the last couple of years. Uh, Herb Kelleher, uh, not that I knew him that well, but he was one of these people who really just inspired me and, and talked straight. And every time I had an interaction with him, you know, we, you know, five or six times, I was super impressed by his character and his humor. And he was way more successful than I'll ever be, but he kept it so real and so fun that that was an inspiration. As a matter of fact, I have, I have, I don't, I don't know if this is going out in video, like this is like, those are his cigarettes. I f took the pack of cigarettes that he gave me. Uh, I made him sign the cigarettes. Like this is Herb's cool menthols, right? This is how wow. much I idolized Herb. So there's Herb's sig on the back of the cigarettes. And the other guy that I idolized um, who died last year was my dad. So there's dad. Um, those two men who, who were from a different generation, they had a, a quality that I have yet to uh, acquire, which is this, I, I don't even know what it is. It's like they have this, this wonderful... Uh, I, I wish I, I, I'm still trying to figure that out. So, so, so those two, um, among the living, <laughs> you know, uh, my wife is huge. Uh, so mm -hmm. Anna, uh, is one of the few people who will tell me, and she has to tell me this frequently when I'm doing something nuts or <laughs> am acting stupid or so, uh, and you know, we got married back when I was, you know, pre-square. Uh, so, you know, she doesn't have anything to prove. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, I've I, and I talk about this in the book, I've never really had, had a lot of mentors um, because up until I researched the book, I didn't realize that I needed a different type of mentor. 
that I needed somebody like AP Giannini was. I needed, I needed a mentor who was an innovator, somebody who was not copying what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And I know, I, I know a ton of super successful people who have copied a formula and they're very good at that. And that formula makes them money, but that's not the game I play. Mm -hmm. So those mentors, although I, I have a lot of friends in that category and they will give me advice. If I take their advice and I implement it, it blows up in my face. Like, and, and this happened to me for years before I realized that, well, first of all, for years, I thought I was an idiot, you know, because I would, I would see my friends who were successful and I would say, well, how did you handle this problem? And they say, oh, well, just do this. And I would go and I would do that. And then it would blow up in my face. And I was like, what the hell's going on here? And, and, you know, eventually the conclusion was, well, it's just me. I'm, I'm just incompetent. I can't handle this stuff. What I realized, you know, like, 20 years later, having researched and, and written the book was, wait a second, there's, there's a different set of math mm -hmm. that works if you're innovating. And for very specific reasons, doing the thing that works for everybody else is not going to work for you. And doing the thing opposite sometimes will. And, you know, I, I talk about this, you know, in the later chapters, but that's, that's just been a profound insight because it's allowed me to feel sort of better about all my failures because I was like, oh, oh, well, it wasn't that I was like fundamentally flawed uh, so much as I was doing things the wrong way for the situation that I was in. Mm -hmm. So I have so many questions about like the mentality of when you created Square with Jack. One thing is you wrote in your pitch pack, you wrote like 140 reasons Square will fail. And then you still like push forward. And then you guys chat with the guy from MasterCard or something. And then like that guy will tell you, oh, you can't do this, can't do that. And then like after a week, you find there are 17 flaws in your, you guys are breaking the laws. And I feel like by that time, I would have moved down to create the, I guess, some other things than focusing on building Square. What was the mentality back then to kind of help you push things forward? So in the founding of Square, there were two moments that were so impactful to me that I, I remember exactly where I was when they happened. Mm -hmm. And one, I was driving my car around St. Louis. I was talking to Jack on the phone. He was in California. I was in St. Louis. And look, this was 2008, 2009. Like the, mm -hmm. the, the economy was just disaster, disaster zone, right? The, the, there was a huge huge um, financial crisis. Um, and a lot of people would say, well, that's a terrible time to start a business. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, to, I told Jack, I was like, you know, look, I think a recession when there's just blood in the streets is a great time to start a new business. And Jack was like, me too. Like Jack was like, yeah, now's the time you go when, when, when it was just chaos. And, you know, having a business partner who has that same attitude, because Jack and I don't think alike on a lot of things, like we have very disparate opinions, but the fact that we were together on that one was great. And then the second time it happened, and I wrote about this in the book, um, was the first day at the office when I discovered what we were doing actually violated some laws. <laughs> and, and, you know, eventually we counted 17 things, rules that we were breaking um, with each transaction, but the the moment when I turned to Jack and Tristan, who was our one employee, uh, and said, guys, what we're doing is illegal. And they got excited. They were like, cool. Oh, well, actually, <laughs> Tristan, I'm like, what do you want to do? But Jack was like, you want to quit? I was like, no, I don't want to quit. You want to quit? He was like, no, I don't want to quit. And that was it. Like, like you know, we figured that it was, I mean, and I'm not trying like this is, you know, this is not a law like murder, you know, uh, it's, it's, this was some stupid rule that was a vestigial part of a banking system that had evolved 50 years ago and didn't account for, you know, all sorts of things, uh, you know, but just the fact that the guy who I'd chosen to go into business with and who chosen to go into business with me had this attitude of great, there are things preventing us from doing what we're doing. Now we've got something interesting because look, if there's no barriers, then somebody's probably walked that path a hundred times before you. And there's probably nothing that interesting at the end of that path. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might, there might be some money. There might be some 
some notoriety. But like, if you want to do something that hasn't been done, you get a, you better get ready for a bunch of barriers. And so the fact that Jack got excited about that as opposed to scared meant that I picked a good partner. Wow. I mean, you sort of also answered my next question, which is like, how do you pick a good business partner? Because you recognize Jack when he was also, I guess, no one. And then he was a guy you met at his mom worked at a coffee shop. You buy coffee beans from, and then you met randomly, right? So, and yeah. then I, it's really hard right now in all these Uh, VC accelerator here, they taught you to think you either have uh, someone who is like your brother or like some friends that you met for like, you know, many, many years. So you know them or you find people with very different skill sets and then just like really basically finding a partner that's really strategically. But from your story, it sounds like you guys didn't really think that much. It's just like, okay, so I'm going to work with this guy. So curious about what does that mean for a regular person? Like how should they find a co-founder? Well, I think, you know, if you're looking for a co-founder, one of the things you want to do is complement your deficiencies. So fortunately for me, my deficiencies are fairly well known because I've tried stuff and failed. And I like, well, I probably shouldn't be doing that sort of thing. Um, so I had a pretty good list and, you know, Jack has a complimentary set of uh, skills and deficiencies. So that, that worked and we'd already worked together. So that was great. Um, but, you know, the other thing that I think is important, and this is probably going to get around to being more center stage in the world thought right now, because there's this huge push towards, you know, diversity and inclusion, you know? So just because somebody's the wrong age or wrong gender or wrong sex or wrong race, or there's some, you know, like we've excluded so many potential partners because of the way, you know, society just treats people. And um, I, I'm not to say that I'm above that, but I, I, I've always been one of these people who I think doesn't really care what you look like, what, what age you are, what race, you know. And so one of the biggest biases I think mm -hmm. is age. And you know, when I met Jack and started working with him, he was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that raised some eyebrows, but he was also really good. So I didn't think twice about giving him a bunch of you know, projects for him to manage as a 15 year old. <clears throat> and so I think that, that gives you a natural advantage. Like if you can look past whatever people's quantities are. And when I say quantities, mm -hmm. It's like stuff that I can put on a form, right? Okay, so what's your gender? What's your age? What's your net worth? What's your, I mean, you know, we can, we can sit there and turn you into a series of spreadsheets mm -hmm. and none of that crap really matters when you're looking for the qualities of somebody who is gonna be a good partner because the qualities are like, how, how do they respond when, your product is breaking a law, right? Like if Jack had had a fundamental different set of beliefs, Square wouldn't exist, you know? And if I'd been evaluating my choice of partners on purely qualitative or quantitative means, I probably would have missed some of these more subtle things. So. So don't get distracted by the numbers. I really like that you are saying like, you know, don't get hung up by your own like mental barriers because there's a lot of things that you're probably jack was 15 you were maybe 20 something 30 something but there's a lot of things that people preset in their mind that kind of like block you from block them from like i guess like finding the right partners instead of like looking for skill set people normally tend to look for people do they have like the similar profile uh, as like someone that you're looking for. I really like that you are just focusing on, you know, this person's quality. And in, instead of like this person's, do they have like the perfect background? I, I really like that. So, I mean, I've had a lot of really lucky moments. Um, when I was in college, um, there was a guy named Sam and he was homeless. And he, this was, you know, in St. Louis, it's not a great place to be homeless because it's really cold mm -hmm. in the winters. And so Sam would hang out at the, at Washington University and he had a bag with his stuff in it and he slept in a car in the parking lot and a big beard. You know, sometimes he'd smell kind of funny, um, but he was a nice guy. And, and I'd see him all the time because every time there was a university function when they were giving food away, 
you know, Sam would show up. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, one day I was sitting in the student center and Sam was, you know, sort of nearby. And I was just devastated. Like, I, c- I couldn't do this, this math problem. And, uh, and he looks over at me, he says, he says, what's, what's the problem? And instead of saying something like, oh, you wouldn't understand or nothing, you know, like basically treating him like a homeless guy, I said, well, I could, there's a differential equation that I, I don't know how to do. And he's like, well, what kind of differential equation? And I said, well, it's a second order non-homogeneous differential equation. And he's like, well, did you factor it? I was like, what? He's like, well, you got to factor it. Like if you just solve a second order non-homogeneous difference, you have to turn it into a homogeneous part and a non-homogeneous part. And you do that. I was like, I was like, what? Like you're a homeless dude and he can solve. So, so it turned out this guy was a math professor. Like before he became homeless, he was a math professor. But just the fact that I was getting hope, I was getting my math help at WashU's engineering school. <laughs> The guy who literally slept outside a lot um, just really sort of reset a lot of my biases. And, and, you know, from a very early age, I've been lucky to have people who've broken stereotypes for me. Um, but, you know, if you're thinking about this as a listener, it's, it's not enough to sit there and say, well, you know, don't be biased or don't, don't prejudge people. Cause look, Everybody says that crap and it doesn't really work. I have a lot of biases. I lot I have a lot of prejudices. Like I I I I do judge people way too fast sometimes. Like, you know, I will I will assume something based on how you're driving your car and what car you're driving and where you are. And I mean I make all these assumptions. But what I what I try to keep in mind is look, I know I'm a biased person, and therefore I have to be extra careful to not let that totally dominate my decision making. Like when there's other facts presented, like the homeless guy is solving your math homework for you. Like, are you going to be willing to accept that? Or are you just going to say you smell funny and you sleep in the, you know, in an old Buick in the Washu parking lot? Like, I don't think the two things have anything to do with each other. Just because you sleep out, you know, in a car in the parking lot doesn't mean you can't do differential equations. <laughs> I really think that, you know, you're taking a chance on him too to ask him that question. And then I guess whatever you said was right that, you know, like you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, although everybody does that. You will be surprised by a lot of people that you met by like their skills or like things that they do. I'm curious about, so I think you started Square to serve people, your friend Bob, or like people that are like more, you call it like the, the little guys, I think. in yeah. your book. So not pejoratively, but the people who've been left out. Right. Yeah. So the Bank of America founder, Ikea founder, Southwest founder, all kind of did the similar things, right? They all served a market that doesn't exist before. That's such a great mentality to a, like, I guess, like help people that are, wasn't really being served. And then, but to create solution for these people or creating a solution for a problem that nobody has solved before, it's going to take a lot of, it's like a challenge. Curious, how do you come up with a solution on that? Like, basically, how do you come up with a plan for solving a problem in general? Okay. So, so what's the formula? Okay. Um, th- this is the one I use. Uh, First, determine what type of problem you have. And if you think about the sample set of problems, you can divide easily into problems that other people have figured out how to solve and problems that people have not figured out how to solve, right? So that's that's sort of a good line to demarc or demarcate because you want to know what side of that line you're on because the skills are different. And if you're on the side of the line where people have figured it out, then by all means, figure out who's figured it out and do what they did. You know, go to YouTube, download a course, take a masterclass, go, go get another degree. I like whatever it takes or hire somebody who already has that skill because you don't have time to acquire it yourself. Um, Mm -hmm. But that's a good way to solve those types of problems, right? Um, 
But if you're on the other side of the line, I think it gets more interesting. And that's the side of the line that people don't talk about much. That's the side of the line where you don't get to copy the solution. Mm -hmm. So if you find yourself on that side of the line, first and foremost, and I talk about this a lot in the book, is, is, is the ability to recognize that. Okay, so, but let's say, let's say you've, you've exhausted YouTube, you've searched Google, you talked to all your friends, <laughs> you've been at the library, you talked to your great uncle, you know, uh, like, and you can't find anyone that solved the problem. Then what you need to do is very honestly ask yourself, are you willing to do what it takes to solve an unsolved problem, knowing that it's probably going to be uncomfortable, knowing that you're probably not going to get a lot of support from people. And it's not because the people don't want to help you. It's the, because the people care for you and want to protect you. So they're going to say, come back here, Grace. Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't take that. Don't, you know? Um, so I, and again, I'm not giving any, a formula here, but I'm, I'm just telling you that the, sort of the, the way I approach this stuff now is with the insight that traveling is way different if you're an explorer versus a tourist. Okay. So let's say you and I want to go on a trip mm -hmm. and I go, okay, Grace, we're going to go traveling. And you show up and we're about to jump on the airplane and you've got a beautiful silver suitcase with wheels on the bottom. And I've got on, you know, basically a pack of water and a knife. <laughs> and you go, wait a second, where are we going? And I'm going, we're going to go to the jungle. And by the way, those little wheels on the bottom of your suitcase are, are, are not going to be any good. You know, um, if you assume that you're being a tourist, when you travel, which is what I usually do when I travel, I expect there to be a hotel and food and water and, you know, probably some entertainment and, you know, maybe a mint on the pillow if I'm lucky. Like there's all sorts of cool stuff that I get when I'm a tourist. That's, that's one type of traveling. The other type of traveling is somebody pushes you out of an airplane with a parachute over the Amazon. You drop into this place where there's no human life and you have to, you know, survive. And there are, but, there are a bunch of bugs and plants and animals that want to eat you, you know, and that's a different type of traveling. That is a different. So, so understand the difference. Like if you come packed for a weekend in France and somebody pushes you out into the jungle, you're not going to be very happy. doesn't mean you're going to die, but it means you're not as well prepared as if somebody said, Hey, look, we're going to the jungle. So maybe for the next uh, month, you want to really get, a bunch of malaria shots, uh, learn how to skin a snake or recognize edible plants. I mean, I don't know what you do to prepare for the jungle because the fact is the jungle is not predictable, but it's a, it's a at least you will be helped by the mindset. So what I wanted my readers to understand is that, look, we don't go to the jungle every day. Some of us never go there. Some of us are never going to have the will or even the opportunity to, to go do something that's never been done before, but some of us will. Okay. So what if you're the person who just happens to have the ability to solve one of humanity's unsolved problems? You've, you've just got it. Like you don't know you got it, but you got it. And then all of a sudden you come against that problem, but your whole life you've been taught to only copy your whole life. You've been taught to not do something if you're not qualified and you, you see that problem and you go, well, I'm not qualified. I can't do it. And that's, that's why I wrote the book because you're wrong. Yes, you are unqualified, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. And, and, and if you actually, when I was writing the book, I had a very specific person in mind. She's brilliant. She's, she's got a master's degree from the world's best institutions. Like she's fantastic. But every time she comes in, it's a problem that she hasn't solved before she quits. And my, my 300 page message, 300 page message to her is basically to say, look, the first time that human, humankind does anything, it's done by somebody who's not qualified. You know, you're just not qualified to do something the first time you can't be, cause we haven't figured out what the qualifications are. So, so don't automatically quit. And I wanted to reach, 
I mean, I want this book, or at least the ideas of the book. I don't care about how many books sell, but I want the ideas to reach into the heads of millions of people because I think we've got a lot of problems and I want millions of people willing to maybe step over that line and take some risk and, and help, you know, hopefully move us all ahead. You know, speaking of like what to invent, what not to invent, you mentioned a lot about like, oh, you know, I would copy whatever I can copy on, until, you know, I can't copy them anymore. So basically you, you were saying if there is a solution for something, copy it. But if there's no solution for something, you know, you invent it. Curious about how do I figure out what is the part that I could reinvent um, instead of if I reinvent wow. everything that's. Yeah, that's a great question. Way. That's a great question, but let me rephrase your question to make it a little more um, stark. Your question is, Jim, please tell me what I'm capable of doing <laughs> and when I should quit, right? You, you want me to sit there and say, okay, Grace, here's a problem that you can solve. Go do it. And this one you probably ought to stay away from because you can't. Nobody's going to give you that answer. You can't even have that answer. You don't know. And that's part of what makes innovation scary because if it's being done for the first time, what's the checklist? How many, how many, how many things do you need to do? You don't know. You don't even know if it's physically possible to, to accomplish. And yet your question, like baked into that question you just asked me is, is the thing that we all want, which is this guarantee. We want this, oh, please, Jim, I'll buy your book if it contains this formula that guarantees I'm going to have success. Like, it ain't in my book. Save 20 bucks, right? Because you ain't going to get it. You know, what you'll get is, is a pretty candid discussion of how it feels to actually do it. Mm -hmm. And some examples of people who have done it and maybe some patterns you can use, but you're not going to get a formula. And you're also not going to get any sort of guarantee that you're going to succeed if you do it. So I'm sorry, but that's, that's just sort of the bargain. Have you ever tried something else that you didn't succeed, but like you, you were using like the same mindset and then why did you, I guess like- All the time. Oh my God, it happens <laughs> like all the time. So I'm an engineer by training, which, which is to say engineers work on things that are broken, mm -hmm. right? I don't apply my skills to anything that works. Sorry. So- Right now, I am trying to build this piece of glass. I'm making this piece of glass in the studio. It's never been done before that I can find, so I have to invent all these new techniques. It's a real pain in the ass. One of the techniques involves cutting the glass in a way that's never been cut before. Turns out there are no saws anymore. That can, I'm literally rebuilding this saw from like the 1970s that's, that I think if I can figure out how to put it together correctly, we'll be able to cut this special piece of glass that I'm trying to make. Like, that saw is in 50 pieces. It's a god awful mess. And by the way, if any of your listeners happen to own a new Dyna cut saw, I will pay you $25,000 for one. I know it's double the rate, but I, I will give you 25 grand right now for a Dyna cut wet saw. If you have one, you call me and I'll freaking put your kid through college. I mean, that's how badly I want to get one of these saws. But I spend my days as an engineer working on stuff that's broken. So when you ask me how much of my stuff does it work, my answer is all of it, you know, like nothing. I mean, okay, the Fed works. I'm a, I'm a director of the Fed. Um, the Fed's doing pretty well right now. But of the stuff that I'm actually actively involved in, it's all broken. That's what I work on. I feel like it just takes a lot of courage to keep pushing sometimes. And so I think the concept of innovation stack after I read it, why Square succeed when Amazon was trying to copy was because Square was doing 14 things right. And then Amazon could copy two or three things. And, you know, people can see from the on the outside, oh, like, you know, starting a podcast, you need an equipment, you need to get guests like yourself, like you need to get guests, you need to kind of like record every week and then on your iPhone or something. But people don't realize that you need to promote it. How are you going to distribute it? How are you going to package it as like a whole thing, right? So I think that's like the major concept of the book from my understanding, from, excuse my really bizarre language, but anyway. I loved your language, but there's one word I'd argue with. 
uh, and it was your use of the word courage. And, and the reason I'm, I'm picking on that word is because I think to say that innovation or entrepreneurship is courageous is a little bit scary. Um, what I would say is instead of thinking of yourself as being courageous, mm-hmm. which I'm not, by the way, I'm afraid <laughs> of a lot of stuff. Um, think of yourself as stubborn. I think stubbornness is a little more approachable for people. Like uh, I can be stubborn. I can be very stubborn. Um, and that's almost as good. You know, so it, it's funny because when I studied all these people for this book, I found that a lot of the successful ones weren't these sort of bold, courageous, adventuring types. They were just normal folks who found themselves in a situation where through whatever twist of fate, were not able to copy. And with the copying removed, they were forced to either invent something or die. And they were too stubborn to die, so they invented something. And they kept working on that until it eventually produced results. And then those results eventually built companies that you know, were leaders in the world. And that's a pattern that I think is open to everybody. So not just the courageous, it's not just something that you have to have courage with. So, and this is, this is something really interesting. You know, when I, when I originally wrote the book, it was a graphic novel. Yeah. It was just cartoons. The cartoons. And uh, I worked really hard. I worked it for about a year. And then I was so proud to like tell Herb Kelleher that I'd done this story, not as some boring business book, but as a bunch of cartoons. Mm-hmm. And Herb hated it. He hated the idea. Um, it, and he hadn't even seen it. Like I just described the idea to him. And he's like, Jim... He's like, if that's what you're going to do, you can leave me out. So I obviously didn't want to leave her out of the book. I would like rewrote it, but I was, I was really sort of heartbroken that he didn't, he didn't like my idea, but, but, but the wisdom of his Mm -hmm. reluctance was that comic books are for heroes. They're hero stories. Mm -hmm. Who's the protagonist in a comic book? It's somebody with superpowers or at least super strength, or, you know, they've got something that, that, that is not human, right? And so if you sit there and, and tell the stories of successful people, and you say, this person is super successful because he or she is smarter or stronger or somehow superior to you in some way, well, that's a good excuse for me as just a normal person to quit. I don't have super strength. Bullets don't bounce off me. You know, my hair's falling out. Like I can't do a damn thing about growing eyelashes. Like I'm, I'm really a mess. How am I a, a, a able to do this great thing? Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to make sure that your listeners understand. You don't have to be a courageous person. You just have to put yourself in a situation where sheer stubbornness will produce a result. And I show you how to do that. Yeah. Like, I think that's like a good word. And I'm curious, do you think it's a numbers game? Like to be successful is a numbers game. Like you just try multiple times, try multiple things and then something will work out. I don't think it's a numbers game. I mean, in the sense that you have to do things the right way. You can't just keep trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. Eventually you will succeed. That is part of it. You do have to keep trying and trying and trying. Eventually you succeed. But it's the way you try. So it's not just a case of any effort works and enough effort eventually, you know, uh, yields a result. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's the monkey solution, right? We give a, give a monkey a typewriter, they'll eventually type Shakespeare if you give them enough tries. And yes, that's true. However, the, you know, four quadrillion times that it fails is probably more than you can sustain. So I'm a big believer in process and doing things the right way and approaching, like they're, they're processes even for innovation that work. And the reason we think of it as a numbers game is because if you are on the, if you're on the outside looking in, if you're looking at people who are incredibly successful I mean, luck plays a part. Um, and I talk about, I actually go through the math of luck in, 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 in one of the chapters, but you don't want to depend on luck. 
you don't want to think, oh, every day I'm just going to get lucky or maybe, well, but whatever works for you, whatever keeps you going. Um, but you do have to eventually do things in the right way. So you can't just be, uh, you, you just can't be, you know, just a monkey typing on a typewriter. That doesn't work. What? is doing things in the right way. Uh, how do you be smarter in your second approach, third approach? Can you give us an example of how do you tackle a particular problem that it's not a numbers game, but like after the second or third try, you kind of figure out a solution for it? So I, I guess this brings the whole interview around to one of your first questions, which is humility. And I think humility is super important to be successful in innovation. And by humility, I mean, you know, the ability to accept news that you don't believe is true. The ability to not think you're always right. And you have to balance humility with the hubris to keep going. So you have to have this stubbornness, this hubris, this pride or determination to keep going and not give up. But along that path, I think you should be very, very open to the fact that what you have thought was right might not be. And if you can maintain that humility, what you'll find, at least, I mean, look, I can't speak for you, but I'll tell you, in my world, I find that a lot of solutions just come to me. Now, they are unfortunately not the ones that I thought of, you know, so I don't get to say, oh, that was my idea, you know, um, or I don't get to have the pride of saying, well, I'm a visionary. I knew Bitcoin was going to go to $50,000. I didn't know that, you know, like, like there, there you can. You can get a lot of information from the world mm -hmm. if the information doesn't have to fit what you know at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of deep, I guess. I don't know. Like, I think that makes sense. I'm curious about all these example that you've used, I guess Square included are, I don't know, like, so basically like Southwest Airline, Ikea, Bank of America, all kind of, I guess, especially Southwest Airline and Ikea, they're all comp very competitive on price, right? So how they stay competitive should be, you know, control their price. I think Herb Kelger said like, you know, he doesn't want to, you know, like people ask him like, oh, how are you going to make profit or something? He is not really increasing profit on purpose. He is staying, he wants to stay competitive with the price always, right? If you are trying to create a company for the people that are underserved and staying competitive with the price, how are you going to just like keep going with a lower price when other people, so how do you stay competitive in general when you're creating a company? So it depends if you have an innovation stack or not. If you're copying what everybody else does, you're pretty much going to be locked into a set of prices that's very similar to what they can do because you're doing it the same way. So you do a process the same way as somebody else. You're likely going to get a very similar result, um, which is why you see companies pricing very close together. Um, if you have an innovation stack, then there is a very high likelihood that your price will be or could potentially be way lower than other companies because you're doing things in a totally different way. And because you're doing things in a totally different way, you can be wildly more efficient. Now, the question is, what do you do with that efficiency? Do you price like the rest of the market or do you give people who could not otherwise afford it a chance to buy your product? This is a big decision. Um, what I found in my research is that the companies who keep their prices low so that new people can enter the market, end up dominating that market. And because they're so efficient, it's very hard for competitors to catch them. So, I mean, you mentioned Herb Kelleher, and I'll tell you that, you know, for the 20 years he ran Southwest Airlines, they were profitable every year, except maybe one, I think there might've been one year where there was a gas shock or something, but like there was a very, very strong record of profitability. But during that time, Southwest prices were also a quarter what the other airlines were charging. Well, how is that possible? Well, the answer is Southwest had an innovation stack that allowed them to fly planes way more efficiently than all their competitors. And because Herb never competed with, he, he never priced uh, by comparing himself to his competitors. They maintained that for 20 years. And then as a very interesting case study, when Herb left the helm at Southwest, the new manager 
decided to raise their prices and they kept raising and raising and raising until they actually got in trouble with the government for price fixing um, and eventually gave away their advantage. Southwest had the, um, the travel market uh, basically to itself for, for years under Herb and, and now they've got six or seven very strong competitors. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect case study on, on how the effects of pricing in an innovation stack change the course of the company. So if you're doing Square again and then Amazon started saying we're doing the same product back in time, I mean, you basically mentioned that you did nothing, right? So how would you tell your younger self to, you know, like react to the fact that, you know, Amazon is copying us? Like, Well, I mean, it all worked out. So I wouldn't want to do things any differently. Um, but I think my advice to my younger self would be to just say, you don't understand the power of what you've built because you don't understand what an innovation stack is. But me being your older time traveling self <laughs> has seen the future and guess what? <laughs> you win this one and here's why. Um, and I go through the math of that in the book, but fundamentally uh, it's very, very hard to copy a company with an innovation stack, even if you're Amazon even if you're one of the most powerful firms on the planet. And you know, that was a central insight that led to the research behind the book because you wouldn't think that's possible, but I prove it. And then I show how it not only happened to Square, but I happen to have you know, dozens of other companies and I show the process of how it happens. And once you understand that process, maybe you can rest a little more, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a little more peacefully. But look, it's not gonna be that comforting. Because again, everybody wants a guarantee in life. And if you're doing something that hasn't been done, you don't get that. So even time traveling back to talk to myself, I probably wouldn't say anything except maybe wear more sunscreen. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious about like, uh, so if you and I are starting a company today, and then let's say we start, I guess like a masterclass for tech. And then what if like the, the company masterclass is gonna copy us, what should we do? Well, um, it's a question of what are you doing when they copy you? Like is your business model to basically be a smaller, cheaper masterclass or is your business model to do something fundamentally different from what they're doing? If the answer is you're copying them, and then they decide to copy you, yeah, you're pretty much toast if they have more resources than you do. Um, or, or I shouldn't say you're toast. I can't give you any advice on how to win that win, okay? But if you've built your company on innovation that differentiates your product and your customers and you know the, the way your company runs from the way they run, then I'd say you've got a very good chance of surviving that. Wow, that's uh, that's interesting. What if like some other company are doing similar things? Let's say Uber and Lyft. I heard a story on um, you know, Lyft started first, and then Uber copying Lyft, and then Uber is more successful. How do you kind of like explain that kind of situation? So it was interesting. Um, I was an advisor to a company called Sidecar, <clears throat> which was Lyft's main competitor. And I outlined a strategy that I thought was definitely going to help them beat Lyft. And they ignored me, so I quit. I was like, well, if you don't want to listen to me, because they just copied Lyft and Lyft wiped the floor with them. Um, Uber copied Lyft, but you know, they, were, they were very close as far as what they were doing. Plus, Uber had some more experience with the black cars. Um, so they, they came at it, and also Uber was more successful fundraising. Um, but you know, a lot of it might've just been execution. I think they're both very successful companies. Um, and I don't, I don't know enough about the specifics because for like four years there, Uber and Uber and square were in the same building. Mm -hmm. Like we moved in first mm -hmm. and then they kind of copied what we did and moved a couple of floors. <laughs> from and then they started stealing our engineers, which really pissed me off. So I've always hated Uber for stealing some of our engineers. Um, so like, I'm not a good person to comment on the Uber list thing. Cause I take it personally. Um, but 
you know, the whole thing with, uh, with, with that is you have, you have a situation where both of those companies had an innovation that the other could copy. And so after a while, neither one of them could outmaneuver. They were just incrementally improving their products. And, you know, Uber would add tip or Lyft would add tipping. And Uber was like, oh, Lyft is winning. We're going to add tipping. And uh, Uber's maps were better. And Lyft was, Lyft was like, hey, we need to steal some engineers from Uber and figure out how they did the maps. And they got two guys over and all of a sudden they tell, you know, tell them how Uber did the maps better. And those, oh, yeah, we need to you know, do different caching on our servers. And now Lyft's maps work as well as Uber's. You know, like, so, so those, those guys are locked in this sort of competitive race. It, it could have been a singularity. Like it could have been a company coming out without the ability for anyone else to copy them. But that's a rare case. Usually in that case, you have to be extremely... Uh, deep in your innovation stack. You have to do so many things that are not visible to the public. Um, and that's what really protects you. It is really interesting that like, because I saw a lot of like the Chinese publications, I guess like nowadays, like people just copy, like I, I think one of the biggest fear of publishing anything on social media, it's like this thing may be copied by someone else. And then you can't really say they, they copied it because I guess like they copied it seamlessly. How do you kind of still make sure yourself stand out after someone else copying you in like very small scale? Maybe we're well, not building school. So it depends what side of that line you're on. If you are in a business where pretty much everybody copies everyone else and the business, there, there are three or four, you know, similar companies, then you can't really protect yourself that much. There's, there's nothing that's going to keep you from preventing your, 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 your best employees from joining your competitors, from your customers to you know, switching because of a little feature or a price change or somebody gets pissed off at somebody, you know, um, that's, but occasionally you get an advantage and then you get to charge more for a while and then everybody copies you and you don't have that advantage anymore. And that's sort of how the world works in a lot of ways. Um, that's not the game I talk about. I talk about these companies that begin with an area of focus that's so outside the existing market that the existing market doesn't have tools because they don't have the tools that they can just buy from the existing market. They have to invent new tools. Well, those new tools are going to have different effects in different, in different ways will produce a radically different final product. And you might not see it as a radically different final product if you sort of view it from the outside, but from, from within, it is way different. And in those cases, uh, you're, I'm not going to say immune to copying, but you are very, very protected. You know, that's, you've had the second shot of the vaccine in that case, you know, you're not, it's, it's not a zero chance, but you got the second shot of the vaccine. Hey man, you can go to the beach again. You can go to a restaurant again, I guess, uh, you know, I've had a few friends who've gotten both of their shots and they're having a good time. Um, the <laughs> point is you, you get a reward for taking the path of innovation. What you don't get is a guarantee that you will be able to complete the path. I have a little fire on for you. One is what's your favorite book? Uh, Satan, his psychotherapy and cure by the unfortunate Dr. Kassler. Jeremy Levin was the author. It's out of print. Jack and I both read it back in the 90s. Hilarious story. Um, favorite book that I'm reading right now is um, Churchill's set of uh, uh, World War II. And I'm just in the gathering storm was reading it last night. Who made the biggest impact in your career? I was pretty much alone. Uh, you know, my partnership with Jack has been a big deal. Uh, so I guess I'd give it to Jack. Um, but I was so weird when I was doing the stuff that I was doing early in my career and nobody else was doing it that I wish I'd had more impactful people, but I just never found that, that person. So it was tough, but I always go to my dad for help. Like I'd go home feeling bad and dad would make me a martini and. Wow. Make you a martini. That was that. 
Yeah. <laughs> Love that. That、uh, sounds like a great problem solver. Who would you invite to your dinner party? Who do I invite to my dinner party?、Um, people I disagree with.、Um, I would be so interested in all these people who, like, are climate change deniers. How the hell do you? How the, I don't understand that. You know,、um, conspiracy theorists. Like, I don't understand conspiracy theorists because, like, if you've ever tried to run anything, like, you know that shutting people up is so difficult. Like, how are you going to maintain a conspiracy? I don't know. Like, I would try to find, not not exclusively, but people. You know, you want some people who are positive and you know、uh, have a good attitude. But I I I love spending time with people who I don't understand and disagree with. That's that's really interesting. And I I spend a lot of time now、um, because I'm on the Federal Reserve. I'm a I'm a deputy chair of the of the Fed in St. Louis here. And、um, if you join the Fed, you have to. Be politically neutral. So I'm not Republican. I am not Democrat. I am not allowed to take a side in、uh, in anything. And so for the entire Trump presidency, I was politically neutral.、Um, and it's given me a lot of really good insights because instead of arguing with people, I just sat there and listened. And I've learned a lot from both sides. And I I really appreciate the fact、uh, that the Fed forced me to sort of grow in that way.、Uh, it's a wonderful thing to do. Is Listen to folks who you disagree with. What is one skill you're constantly trying to improve? Listening. Where can we find you outside of work? At the Glass Studio, but that's kind of technically work.、Um, <laughs> oh, okay. So here's one.、Um, I'm a pilot. I、uh, just passed my commercial test, but I don't do it as a profession. So I am now.、Um, Getting to the point where, I guess it could be a profession if I really wanted to, but I'm probably not going to be a professional pilot. I'd like to be able to fly that well, but I don't think I ever will. But I'm sure、that's... you're a great pilot.、Um, anyone who survived their own piloting skill, I feel like it's a good pilot. Yeah, I guess by definition, if you're not dead, you're probably good enough, right? <laughs> yes.、Um, so, what do you wish you know when you were twenty? When you were in your twenties? Oh my God, it's exactly the stuff I wish I, I wish I'd known the difference between entrepreneurship and business. I wish I'd known the difference between copying and innovating.、Um, I've made that mistake so many times.、Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't know when I was 20. Like I didn't know when when I was 20 that when people ask how are you doing, that's not a real question, right? <laughs> Like I was like, I'm doing fine. Why do you like? I, why, I, it's 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 communication on a different level. It's social vibing. It's it's expressing concern. It's a way of you know sort of showing love for somebody who, you know, it, it, I didn't understand any of that sort of social stuff because I'm kind of a nerd and I'm probably pretty messed up. But、um, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff like that. But at least cer- certainly in business, the. The differentiation between a business venture and an entrepreneurial venture,、um, and I can use a pilot analogy if if, if you want. This is funny.、Um, if you're a pilot and you're coming in to land a plane,、um, all of a sudden the controls stop working. So normally you push the yoke down, you go down, you pull the yoke up, the plane goes up. That works until you hit a certain speed, and at that airspeed, the yoke no longer makes the plane go up and down. It just stops working.、Uh, and the throttle, which usually makes the plane go faster and slower, you push the flat throttle, and the plane flies faster. It stops working at the exact same airspeed. And what they train you to do when you're a pilot is to recognize this airspeed and effectively control the plane using a different set of inputs. But they're exactly different. And if you don't know this, you die. So literally, every time you've been on an airplane, your life depends on the pilot recognizing this very specific speed and knowing that at that speed or below, they have to control the airplane using a totally different set of control inputs. Otherwise, you die. And that's one of the things you learn as a pilot. And and it's it's analogous to. The world of business, in the sense that 
you can copy, 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 copy all your life. But if you cross that line into innovation and you don't recognize that the control inputs change, that things behave differently in this other world, you're going to crash. So I would have loved to have known that earlier. Wow. Yeah, that's like, I don't know. That's also the, <laughs> I love it. Um, thank you so much, Jim, for coming on to the show today. Grace, good luck to you. This has been wonderful and you were so well prepared. I really appreciate that. I really respect how much effort you put into crafting a quality product.